All right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to another edition of our ongoing Gates Air Connect webinar series. Today's webinar, HD Radio Streamlined and Redefined with the Flexiva FMXI 4G, is presented to you by Gates Air's radio product line manager, Kevin Hyder. Um, and I'm Keith Adams. I'm the marketing communications manager, as always. Uh, today's presentation on the ins and outs of the most up-to-date and flexible importer exporter on the market We'll also include an inside look at the FMXI 4G in action, as Kevin will include a live demo via its web GUI. So you'll want to stick around for that. Before we begin the webinar, we're going to take a quick three-minute break to allow everybody an opportunity to join. So please just sit back and relax, and we will see you in three. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Gates Air Connect our series. This is Keith Adams, Global Marketing Communications Manager for Gates Air, and I want to thank you for making some time available in your day to attend what's sure to be a very informative webinar here. Um, with the help of our esteemed radio product line manager, Kevin Hyder, we're going to pull back the curtain and take a detailed look inside our ward winning <clears throat> excuse me our award-winning embedded hd radio program importer exporter the flexiva fmxi 4g it's never been easier or more cost effective to get your station hd radio ready um, especially now with our fmxi 4g so kevin will explain what it does why it excels over other similar products and uh there will be a little live demo of the gui environment here so he'll show you exactly how it works as always, a question and answer session will take place at the end of our presentation. So we encourage you to enter in any questions you might have in the live chat or top, uh, top chat section, which is directly under this video. 
um, or if you're watching it directly in YouTube, it's at the right of the video. So we'll be answering questions in a first come, first serve manner. So feel free to enter those in uh, at your convenience during the presentation. So uh, that's enough of me chatting. Let's uh, get on with the webinar. Please welcome Mr. Kevin Hyder. Kevin. Yeah, thank you, Keith, and, and thank you for everybody that's joined us on the phone and online today uh, for the webinar on the Gatesair FMXI 4G importer and exporter. Uh, this will be our agenda for today. We'll start out by reviewing the functions of the importer and exporter in an HD system. Uh, we'll look at the hardware of the FMXI 4G and how it compares to other Generation 3 hardware, as well as, as other manufacturers of some of the Gen 4 hardware. I'd like to spend a little bit of time discussing the importance of the analog and digital time alignment for broadcasting an HD system, and also how this new platform can automatically help maintain that. And then finally, we'll take a look at the GUI and uh, do some setup and interaction with the FMXI 4G. And as Keith mentioned, uh, we'll take some questions towards the end. So first of all, for a little bit of review, um, let's talk about the exporter first. The, the primary job of the exporter has been to encode the main audio program, which is generally referred to as the MPS signal. Um, the MPS signal is, is created and then uh, sent via UDP to the XGen card, which is typically located in a Gates Air system in the Flexiva Exciter. Uh, and it can also be a, a standalone box in some of the other systems. Uh, that stream is generally referred to as the E2X stream. Uh, now on the exporter, typically the hardware in the past has always run off of a Linux OS. Um, the early days it was off of a PC type hardware. Uh, more recently in the Gen 3, it was an embedded Linux uh, hardware. The importer, uh, the function of that is primarily to encode the secondary channels, um, it, such as the HD2, HD3, and HD4 channels. It also aggregates the program associated data, the artist and title, the album art, and sends that along with uh, uh, the encoded audio to the exporter via TCP IP. Uh, traditionally, the importer has always been a, a PC type platform. Um, it's generally been OS of Windows. Uh, initially, it was Windows XP. Later on, it was Windows 7. And some of the current versions are Windows 10. Uh, but only since Generation 4 has the importer select uh, been able to support the embedded processor and get off of the PC platform. So the FMXI itself comes in in three different flavors. One of the one of the big differences in the Gen 4 is we're now able to combine both the importer and exporter into a single box. So if uh, if your topology uh, supports it, uh, you can have both the importer and exporter in in one. RU box, um, or in some cases it still dictates some uh, configurations that you have to have a separate importer and exporter. And if that's the case, we can use the very same hardware that we used for the combined option and just configure it with software to support importer functions or exporter functions. So let's take a look inside the FMXI and see what we have. Uh, you'll notice it is a, a 1RU box. Um, on the front panel, it has an LCD as well as a navigation menu system. Most of the general setup functions, such as IP addresses and the general monitoring functions, are all viewable from the LCD on the front panel. There's no need to plug in a laptop uh, to just do general monitoring of the system. Um, down inside the box, you'll see a, a very simple, there's, there's just one circuit board with a couple of uh, modules uh, piggybacked onto them. The first one you see there is the tuner, which we use for the diversity measurements of the analog and digital system, and is also used for confidence monitoring of the HD signal. Um, we have used the embedded PicoZ processor. So whether this is an importer or an exporter or both, now they all have the same common processor. No more using an importer that's under Windows and an exporter that's under Linux. Everything can be combined in the same box and use the same processor. All of the FMXIs come standard with a GPS receiver built in, so you can hook your GPS antenna uh, directly to the back of it, and the GPS is already included. 
Um, the power supply is, is a typical laptop style power supply. Uh, there's also support for a secondary redundant supply. So if, if you want dual supplies, uh, you can do that via the back panel. And on the front, there is also a headphone monitor. So via the tuner that's embedded inside, besides doing the correlation of the HD and digital signals, um, it also allows you to listen to your HD signal and uh, see what it sounds like both off air and coming into the box. On the rear of the box for, for 1RU, we've got a pretty busy box with a lot of connectors on it. The timing connectors are all on the left-hand side. Uh, we have different inputs and outputs for 10 megahertz, 1 PPS, and 44.1. Um, if you're using the internal GPS, then the outputs then can be used to sync your X-Gen card or your other digital gear uh, that's co-located with this. Um, there's also a, a TNC connector on the back for the GPS antenna. Um, you'll see three separate network connections on the FMXI. Unlike our previous product where everything had the same network address, these are three independent network connections. Uh, typically one of them is used for the E2X stream that goes to the exciter. One of them is a management port and then the other one, depending on if you're a, a combo box or a separate importer and exporter uh, that can be used to get the PSD data from your automation. So uh, it's very easy to segment your LANs to, uh, to have your automation separate than your E2X separate from your management port because all three of these can be completely separate network addresses. All of the audio connectors coming in and out of the box come in on RJ45 connectors. We use standard studio hub type wiring. Um, so that you can wire directly to the RJ45s. Uh, we do have pigtails available if you prefer to go to XLR connectors, um, but uh, on the back of the box, the RJ45s work well. On the far right side, you'll see the primary power connection and then also the support for the backup power. So if, if you want a backup power, you can connect a 12 volt supply to the rear panel and you'll have failover in the event of a power failure. And then lastly, up on top and, and kind of the uh, the highlight of the box is the tuner. Uh, the tuner is, is where we do the time correlation. Uh, we've trademarked the term DTAC, which stands for digital time and audio correlation. And we'll talk about that a little bit more and, and how that works within the system. So let's compare the FMXI to some of the previous Gen 3 importers and also some of the other Gen 4 um, importer and exporters. Uh, the primary difference is, is the Gen 3 importers were all PC based. Uh, they all ran Windows. Um, so there was this constant battle with when I do a security update for Windows, do I need to update my audio cards? I'm using a third party audio card. Is that driver compatible with the, with the version of Windows I'm currently using? If you have a GPS card within the computer, the same thing, the Windows drivers are they compatible with, uh, with the OS that I'm using? In addition to the driver and the software problems, you also have a lot of moving parts in a PC. Uh, you may or may not have a hard solid state hard drive, uh, but at the very least, you'll have fans on the CPU, fans within the power supply, all which are prone to failure after, uh, after running a number of years. And then finally with Windows, you'll have long boot up times, the, the time to boot up the Windows in order to get the the core of the X-Gen going is longer than in the embedded approach. So it's, it's a computer. Uh, whereas the FMXI, as we discussed, you have a embedded processor. It's got a very fast boot up time. There are no moving parts, no fans, no hard drives to wear out. Um, you also have a headphone jack, so you, you can plug in and easily hear what's going on, monitor both the audio coming into the box and also the audio that the tuner is picking up um, on air. So it's a much more friendly box, much easier to, to support and to uh, maintain. As I mentioned, we've embedded this tuner um, inside the box and uh, we use the term DTAC for the digital time and audio correction. And what this tuner is doing is it's monitoring both the analog and the digital and keeping everything in sync and in time. 
It also has the ability to look at the relative audio levels and phase of the analog and digital si signals to make sure that they're correlated and in line with each other. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but when the, when the digital HD radio blends from analog to digital, having that correlation is, is very important. Um, so when we designed this box, we, we knew we wanted to have that tuner in from the beginning. We knew we wanted to be able to automatically take care of some of the timing problems that have, uh, have plagued the, uh, the whole ubiquity standard, I guess, really since the beginning. And that was the primary reason for put it in. But after we had it in there, kind of as a secondary function, we also realized that it was very uh, beneficial for troubleshooting the system because you could take that tuner and you could listen to your HD signal off air and, and see if you were actually transmitting all of the secondary channels and see what the primary signal was, was looked like. So uh, the tuner really has two purposes, both being able to, to do the correlation, but also being able to be a, a nice troubleshooting tool uh, built right into the box. So I mentioned that the timing has always been a problem and always been something that's that's plagued the ubiquity standard. Uh, just to kind of go back a little bit uh, to where all this started, initially when the uh, HD radio came out, the exporter was the primary box that we used. Um, and that typically went out to the transmitter site uh, with the X-Gen. And um, we did that, we, we put a GPS antenna on it. And I, I think at that point, the timing, uh, was better. It may not have been perfect, but we didn't have big disparities in timing. Well, as, as time went on and the importer came on the scene, uh, what a lot of us did was we put the importer back at the studio um, because we didn't have the STL bandwidth to run all those channels of audio out to the transmitter site that maybe wanted to pick up an HD2 and an HD3. So it was easier to put the importer at the studio let the uh, importer do all the bit rate reduction and then send that signal over to the exporter, uh, which may or may not have already been located out at the transmitter site. Well, what we found out in, in doing that, um, I'll take it a step farther. Uh, what a lot of people did is they wanted to get their processors back to the studio. So with the importer at the studio, a lot of people then moved their exporter back to the studio too. And, and then sent everything across. So whether you have a split system with an importer at the studio and an exporter at the transmitter or whether they're both together, um, people were realizing that the diversity delay or the correlation between the analog and the digital was floating a lot. And to try to keep that time aligned was getting to be a real problem. And the NRSC did a uh, study in a working group uh, in 2017 and 2018, and they came up with some best practices of how to configure a system and, and how to keep the diversity delay from drifting the, the least. Um, and this example here that's on the screen now, when the when the importer and exporter were moved back to the studio, uh, it wasn't uncommon to see the diversity delay slip by 1,800 or more samples. Um, and and so you you say why is that important? Um, well, a lot of us have stations that are in places that have terrain challenges anyway. So if if you're in a market where you have multipath conditions because of terrain or, or other cases, your HD radio may not just be locking on HD. It may be going back and forth and blending from HD to analog and back to HD again. So if if things aren't perfectly time aligned and perfectly matched up. What typically is already annoying a multipath and an analog signal becomes even even more annoying as a uh, as a digital signal. So as I mentioned, the NRSC back in 2017 and 2018 came up with a document G203. And um, I encourage you to, to download this document. You should be able to search it through Google. If you can't find it, drop me an email and I'll be happy to send you a link to it. Uh, but this paper outlines best practices to keep your analog and digital locked together and, and through 
various tests that uh, a bunch of the engineers in the field that participated in this did, they came up with a spec of that the sample should be kept to plus or minus three samples between the analog and digital, which is, which is a very tight sample and which is one of the reasons we decided we wanted to put that tuner in the box to try to maintain that, that type specification. Um, and just a little background, you know, three samples seems, seems like a pretty tight spec to keep in place. Well, where that comes from is, is Xperia did some models. And uh, the one on the left that you see, if your analog and digital are off by just six samples, when that blend occurs, you end up with three nulls in the audio. The first one occurring at about three and a half kilohertz, another one at about 11 kilohertz, and then a, a third one up at 18 kilohertz. Um, and then if you look at the chart on the right, if you're off by about 50 samples, now you have 23 nulls in the audio, and you can see on that chart where they fall in. So all of a sudden your audio during that blend from analog to digital, um, you end up with these holes in, in the audio. So just for, for reference, you know, in, in some of the reading and some of the research that I've done, if you're trying to tune your exporter of the delay by ear, generally you're pretty lucky to get it within about 200 samples. If you're listening for the echo effect between the analog and the digital, you start to hear it between 200 and 250 samples. So, so to think that you can adjust your importer and exporter and keep it within 50 samples and do it by ear just isn't possible. Um, and so that's why, again, why we decided we wanted to put the tuner in the FMXI. Uh, so the reasons for the drift in the, the analog and the digital timing, are there's a number of things that are outlined in that document. Uh, some of them are network congestion. If you don't have uh, a solid network, you'll end up with jitter on your network, and that will cause delay. Um, site configurations, as we said, if, if you have a separate exporter located separate from your XGen card, or if you have an importer at a studio and an exporter at a transmitter, your diverse, or your delay between analog and digital is going to vary a lot more than if everything is together. So if possible, keeping those together. Um, and then another thing identified in that paper was the GPS timing and how important it is to have a good solid GPS signal on all of your equipment. If, if you have the GPS and the importer exporter, the FMXI, um, it does have a 10 megahertz out then that you can use if you don't have a GPS for your X-Gen. Um, if they're not located together, then you better put an X, a GPS in your X-Gen as well. And then one of the other things identified, of course, was uh, similar audio processing for your HD and your analog setup. Uh, so similar type processing, uh, which I think is uh, pretty generally accepted anyway. Um, so because one of those recommendations is to is to co-locate the importer and exporter, that was a, uh, a perfect reason to have the two built into one box. If, if we're not going to have them in two different locations anymore, um, using the combined importer-exporter is a good solution and a, a technically sound solution for keeping your diversity delay uh, in check. Um, unfortunately, not everybody can co-locate the importer and exporter, and that's why we took and gave you the ability to take the same hardware platform and locate them, diver diversify them, put one at the studio, one at the transmitter. You'll expect that your diversity delay is going to move more, but you should be able to track that with the tuner and it should be able to correct for those. So some of the things that we can do, uh, best practices is, is keeping everything synchronized to GPS, uh, cleaning up the network and, and segregating the network where possible, uh, especially that network segment where the E2X comes from the exporter to the exciter um, and, and making sure that's on a, a reliable and a good network selection. And then the other dynamic solutions are using products like the FMXI. With, uh, with the tuner built in and the DTAC and being able to monitor those in real time and correct them, um, as well as some other third-party solutions that do that, such as the Innovonics Justin, uh, the Bell R, which uh, the FMXI supports, uh, can also do those things. 
So again, those are the three boxes. There's a combined unit. Uh, there's the uh, importer only or the exporter only. They are the, the same hardware platform and it's just different software between the three. So let's take a look and see what the, uh, the GUI looks like. This page here is the, the home page that you'll see when you first log in to the FMXI. Um, if you're familiar with some of our transmitter products, radio or TV products, this will look fairly familiar to you. The green boxes that you see in the middle of the screen um, will turn either yellow or red to indicate a problem in any one of those areas. So if the HD receiver was having an issue, you would expect that button to either be yellow or, or to be red. Um, likewise, the uh, the clock reference if the GPS were to fail that 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 box changes one of the first things I usually look at when I log into a system is this upper right hand corner uh, the HD orange HD logo that you see in the far upper right uh, that indicates to me that the tuner has lock um, you can see below what the uh, carrier to noise ratio of the HD signal is um, on this screen it's 71 so I know I've got a good HD signal um, just to the left of that I can also see where my diversity delay is is my uh, is my digital and analog in check and in this case um, they're both at uh, in sync uh, the, the diversity is 100% complete the ramp you know, to uh, being in time is 100% complete, and the analog is being delayed just a little over eight seconds. Uh, if I go in and look at the receiver itself, uh, the, the first part of the receiver there is just the setup of it, where you put in the frequency of the station. Um, the rest of the part underneath the right hand side is information from the receiver so I can see down there at the bottom that the receiver is picking up HD2, HD, HD1, HD2 and HD4 um, so this is an indication that you know even though I'm sending signals out sometimes there's a problem and maybe one of the HD3 isn't being decoded properly well, this will tell you right here what the receiver sees and which signals are currently being decoded on the right hand side of the screen uh, we've taken some of those critical things like the FM signal and the HD signal and you can set up alarms for those um, and they're customizable as you can see uh, where you can say if you know if we lose the HD signal for uh, 60 seconds then trigger an alarm and leave the alarm uh, active until it comes back off for at least five seconds till the HD is back on air. Uh, so there's quite extensive configuration and alarming that you'll be able to see in the FMXI that you can do along the, the way as well. On the upper right hand side you'll see the uh, the question mark there. We, we do uh, try to keep the online help updated. Um, we've uh, expanded that in version 2 of the software quite a bit um, and so each of the screens have online help um, and also right next to that you'll see uh, a little chart um, where a lot of these screens also have the ability to show a histogram. So you'll see here, if, if I'm maybe having problems with the HD carrier dropping out or something, I can look at it over a period of time and see, you know, do I, do I have a dropout of audio or do I have a dropout um, of HD level? Uh, so you'll, you'll see that as we go through some of these screens that, uh, that some of them have real-time monitoring with them as well. As far as setting up the DTAC, uh, there's a couple of things that, that can be set up. Uh, the DTAC mode here at the very top is either automatic or manual. So if, if you want this to keep the analog and digital in line, you'll be running in an automatic mode. If you have other some other method for doing that, so you use the Innovonics Justin or you prefer to use a Bellar uh, modulation monitor to do that, uh, then you can put it in manual mode and, and let that be done by a third party. If you don't have one of those boxes, then hopefully we can save you for the expense of having to buy one of those boxes and just do all of the uh, diversity delay and correlation within the uh, FMXI exporter-importer. Um, 
The second box there is, is the delay mode. Um, we support both uh, putting the delay in the analog channel as well as the digital channel. So I know some of the stations prefer to use it in the digital channel. Um, that is a, an option that we give you on the FMXI as well. And again, here's an example of the uh, RTAC um, real-time histiogram. Uh, you can see that uh, the yellow line at the top at one of the correlations here, it was off by a sample. Um, it did not make a correction because the, the spec is plus or minus three samples. So it didn't make a correction. The next time it did the calculation, it looked like everything was in time again. And then here it might have been off a sample again and everything was in time. So again, you can go back and you can look at a period of time and see um, what was happening during that time. So again, it's a, it's a nice troubleshooting technique and a nice troubleshooting tool to go back and, and be able to look at some of those things. If we look at some of the other buttons from the main page, the, uh, the audio status um, will take us to this screen here. Um, the screen allows you to do a couple of things. Um, not only is it the audio setup, but it also monitors the PSD data. So the very first box on the left, you can look at the PSD data as it's coming in from the automation system. So, you know, am I getting the data correctly from the automation system? Is it being sent to the right port? Is it being sent, you know, is the FMXI reading it? Uh, by looking there, I can see what the, F the automation system is sending. Um, on the other side, because I have the tuner, uh, mounted in the box, the tuner will look on air and see what the current PSD data is and it will display it in that box. So because there's about an eight second delay, it may or may not be the same information, but again, at least it allows you to look, hey, do I have the right information coming into the box and am I receiving the right information off air? So having that tuner in there really comes in handy for, for doing that type of troubleshooting. And then finally, at the bottom, I wanted to point out one other thing that's a little bit different in the in the Gen 4 system. Um, at the very bottom, there's an audio client address. Um, as we've seen when we were looking at the back panel of the FMXI earlier, um, there is a audio connector to bring in your HD2, HD3, HD4 right into the back of the box. And if, if that's what you're doing, the audio client address will be that loopback address, that 127 address. Uh, but what's new in the Gen 4 is they also support what they call remote audio capture clients. So what I can do is, I think the application here is say I've got a station in one market and I want to simulcast that on an HD2 channel in another market. Well, I can't very easily just plug the audio into the exporter. But what I can do is I can run a separate audio capture client at the origination point and have that audio sent directly to the importer or exporter, say across the company WAN. So what you see on the screen now is a Windows capture client. So in that origination market, if I've got a machine running Windows, I can run the, uh, the Ubiquiti audio capture. I can point it at the IP address of my exporter in the destination market, and it will encode that audio and send it to the exporter um, in that market. Um, right now, it's primarily a Windows 10 application. I believe Xperia is letting some of the IP codec manufacturers write that into their software. So I suspect uh, the Interplex IP link, for example, will have an option down the road to be able to encode directly to the uh, HD codec and then send it to an exporter. Um, and I know in addition to the IP link, there's also some other network appliances currently in the works uh, for doing that same thing. Uh, so you basically have a, a piece of hardware where you can capture audio anywhere across the world and send it back to an exporter across a, a WAN connection. So I think that's kind of neat. And, that, and like I said, that is new in the Gen 4 product. Uh, and then this screen here is, is just an example. The, there's a monitor output for audio, and there is also a, a headphone output. And so 
sometimes the question comes up if, if I've got the headphones and say I'm listening to the HD2 on the tuner, how is the correlation being done uh, to monitor the main channel and keeping those in time align? Well, in the upper right hand corner, you can see when I when I select either the monitor on the back or the uh, headphones on the front to use the tuner, the DTAC simply goes in temporary hold. Um, and there's a timeout setting in one of the screens that you can set. But if I want to listen to HD2 on the headphones, listening for some audio artifact or, or just verifying I've got the right audio, the DTAC will be on hold as soon as I set the headphones down and the timeout timer, which I think defaults to about two minutes, expires then the DTAC will go back into split mode, monitoring the digital on the left, the analog on the right, and making sure that everything is within plus or minus three samples of each other. So that's how we were able to use the tuner and, and kind of get two functions out of it, the DTAC functions and also the, the on-air functions. And then one other my favorite parts about the FMXI, and, and again, this might be familiar to some of you if, if you've used any of our TV products, and, and we're also migrating this GUI into some of our FM products moving forward. But um, we've tried to make loading software as easy as possible. I know uh, some of the previous Xperia products, there was always issues loading software. It was always seemed to be more complicated than it needed to be. Um, well, with the FMXI, what we do is when you load software, we keep the previous version of software in a buffer and makes it easy to go back to it. So in this example on the screen, my demo system, I've loaded three different versions of software. Um, right now, I'm running off the one that's in green. That was the latest version of software. But say I loaded this up and something wasn't working right, my, my pad data stopped working or my album art stopped working and I, I wanted to make sure it was, is it a software problem or what went happen? I can go back to the previous software just by clicking on the activate button of the previous version. Uh, the unit will load the previous version, it will reboot, uh, it takes about two minutes for the Xperia core to start back up, but within two minutes you'll be back to the previous version of software. Likewise, if you want to go back and upgrade back to where you were, that, that wasn't the problem. You, it must be somewhere else. It's just as easy to go back to the new software. So I think this is a real nice feature. It, it, it makes it really easy to do software upgrades. Um, unlike the Windows systems, when you do a software upgrade, you're getting everything. If there's any new security updates to the Linux that we're using, um, if there's any new updates to the Xperia core software, or if there's any new updates to the GUI software, everything comes in one package. When you push it up, you get everything. So you know that the application software is compatible with the OS software, it's compatible with the Xperia software. It all comes in a package and it's all tied together that way. And then finally, um, I just wanted to touch up on the uh, on the logging screens. Uh, the system has extensive logging in it. I think there's somewhere upwards of over a hundred different types of log error type messages that you can get in the log. Each one of those are configurable. So if you want to have email notification of certain errors, if you are using an SNMP remote control system for each error, uh, in the log, for each element in the log, you can go in and say, uh, do I want it to email me, say if the HD4 audio fails, or do I want it to flag the SNMP system, or do I want it to do both? So it's a highly configurable, uh, highly customizable uh, event log and uh, includes email notification in it. So I am going to go to a, a live system now just to kind of show you maybe a few other things uh, that I missed here. Um, like I say, when we go in and, and look at the uh, HD receiver, I don't know how well this will, uh, I don't know how this will, how well this will show on the webinar, but you can, you can see the audio levels. If I, if I scale those windows to 30 seconds, you can see them moving across. If there were any, losses of audio or drops of the HD carrier, you would be able to pick those out of the top graph pretty easy. 
It looks good to me, by the way. Okay, good. Um, there's also extensive setup for, for your networking stuff. As I mentioned, the, the network interfaces are completely separate. Uh, so you have a, a management interface with full settings. You have uh, your E2X interface, um, which is fully subnetable now. I know some people that used uh, previous products due to, to some of the things that Xperia did in the code. Uh, it was very difficult to do a small subnet of just a couple of transmitters and send the E2X to. Uh, that's, that's all been taken care of now, and it's, it's much easier to do through the new system. Um, uh, like I say, the, the GPS is one of the options uh, that you have. Uh, we include the GPS in with it. If, if you absolutely can't get a GPS at that location, you can sync with a 10 megahertz input. And if, if there were a 10 megahertz in coming into this, I would have a green light here, and it would allow me to switch to it over here in the GPS section. Um, GPS status also has you know some some histograms too. Again, I can help troubleshoot if I'm having problems with the GPS. Uh, I can see real time how it's performing. So I think we'll move ahead here. So we have some time for questions. Uh, just you know, a quick review: the the FMXI HD radio importer and exporter um, is a non-Windows-based system. Uh, advantages of that is a fast boot-up time. Uh, you don't need to maintain drivers for the audio cards, and you don't need to maintain operating systems. It's all sold as an appliance and upgraded as an appliance. Uh, you're able to have a combined importer and exporter, which which saves money because you don't need two boxes, but also saves complexity. And it gives you a common management interface for both of those functions. Um, and then the integrated tuner for RTAC and conference monitoring. Um, we believe the FMXI can enhance the listener's experience by making it easier to keep the station engineer to keep the time and level in check. Uh, we also have full support for artist experience, including the MSAC and FTP capabilities for album art. Um, I didn't show it. The same way you upload software for the system, you can also upload like a default station logo through that same mechanism. It recognizes it as a JPEG instead of a software upgrade, and it puts it in the appropriate place uh, for like a default logo. So it's, it's real easy to maintain those things that your listeners are looking for. Uh, we also believe it enhances the engineering experience because it simplifies the installation of HD. Uh, you're not dealing with two separate boxes. You have a, a single box with a single hardware platform to maintain. You have full web browser, web browser control as well as remote access through SNMP and email notification. And you also have confidence monitoring of both the audio and the SNMP. Um, we have been shipping this since December of 2018. And uh, like I say, it comes in those three flavors, importer, exporter, and importer only. Um, just for your information, the, the exporter only and importer only can be upgraded to a combo unit. So say you just get it as an exporter now and later on decide you want an importer exporter combo, there is a upgrade price. Um, and this is these are also compatible with third generation importers and exporters. So um, say you have a, uh, a importer that's still running off of Windows and you really want to get rid of that Windows computer, but your exporter is okay and your exporter uh, is already an embedded processor. Maybe it's the HDE 200. It is possible to buy the Gen 4 importer, get rid of that Windows machine, and then have this talk to a Gen 3 exporter. Um, and then when you have time to update the exporter or better yet, um, update the importer to a combined unit, you can do that uh, at your convenience. So that's how it sold. Uh, Keith, do we have any questions? We, we do, in fact. Um, and uh, let's we can we can jump into that real quick. I just want to. Uh, do some quick housekeeping. First of all, thanks a whole lot, Kevin, for doing this as usual. Um, you know, we, we love it when you're part of these webinars, um, just 
because you're you're hands on in the development of it and understand what the engineers are looking for. So thanks thanks for for doing this. Um, for those of you listening, if you haven't already, um, I know that we have a few questions already waiting for us. But if you yourself want to enter a question into um, this Q and A, just use the live chat or top chat section, as it's called, which is below if you're on the Gates Air site or to the right of this video if you're on uh, YouTube. We'll answer them in a first come first serve manner. This webinar will be available here on GatesAir.com and on our YouTube channel later today. Uh, the same link that you use to view this live presentation um, should work for, for viewing that recording. And in addition, we're going to, uh, I think we're going to be adding this webinar to our educational video library at GatesAirUniversity.com, which is our online hub of lessons and webinars about broadcast engineering. Uh, we encourage you to visit and browse through just a lot of great material there at that site. Again, GatesAirUniversity.com. And finally, if you didn't already know, this webinar, webinar like all the webinars on GatesAir.com, um, it qualifies for a one half of an SBE recertification credit um, under category I of recertification scheduling um, at uh, SBE. So for more information there, you can go to SBE.org and visit their certification section, which is up in their uh, um, navigator header thingy. Um, I work on websites, so I decided to use a high term technology there. Um, terminology. Now on to the questions. Let's get right to them. Uh, first off, we had one from Tim Koza, who asks, are you suggesting that an external GPS 10 megahertz clock for the FMXI and, and the Exciter, or is the FMXI 4G's GPS the master clock for those two when combined? Um, it can go either way. The, the 10 megahertz out of the FMXI is, is very accurate and very uh, tightly controlled with the GPS. So uh, you can, if, if they're co-located with the exciter, you can use the 10 meg out of the FMXI and use it to synchronize the exciter. Um, if, it's po if, if it's not possible to get the 10 meg, then yes, it, it is critical to put the also to put a GPS into the exciter but the 10 meg will work if if it's within reason to get it there okay Eric Schechter asks um, does the time correction function communicate to an Orban processor via IP or perhaps another method uh, hi Eric um, you know we have done that um, development with Bell R and, uh, and they have a method for controlling the exporter delay. And we have done that development with Bell R. We have not done it with Orban yet. If it is a similar process, um, it may be done already as a result of the Bell R development we did. But uh, I will take that on and, and find out what the, what's entailed in doing that and, and see if we can't add that. I, I've had that request from somebody else. So uh, I'll look into it and get back to you, Eric. Thanks for the question. All right, Hans Ulrich asks, uh, where can we get detailed information on the format for the PSD data uh, with some examples, et cetera? Um, much of Hans's programming um, doesn't originate through automation. So what kind of, what, where might he be able to get some detailed information from that program data? Um, there's, a, there's a couple of tools that Xperi makes available now. Uh, one of them is called CS Lite. Um, Xperia had merged with Arctic Palm uh, a couple of years ago, maybe, and uh, so they've made some of those tools available. Uh, I think the CS Lite is a is a no charge version. There's also a more advanced version to it. So you might check the Xperia website or uh, check with somebody at Xperia on that. All right, um, and uh, luckily the community on the webinar is uh, helping each other out um, because Tim asked the second question. He was wondering if there was a way to monitor the HD artist experience, for example, with picture it's sending. And then Eric Schechter replied um, that he uses his Baylar mod monitor for that kind of monitoring. Uh, do, you, do you have any uh, extra input on, on that? Uh, yeah, as far as, um, I'm gonna see if I can switch screens here. As far as the pad data itself, there is an alarm you can set up here uh, that's called stale pad data or PSD stale alarm. So if the pad data hasn't changed in like 100 
in this case, I guess it's 100 seconds, you can enable alarm. Uh, so we've done that for the text. The, the tuner that we're using does support graphics. We haven't done that development yet. We have had some discussions of doing that development. So just like this screen where you, you see the pad data coming in and the pad data off air, I would like to be able to do the same thing with album art, show what the album art's receiving off air and what the album art is uh, coming into the system. And you could also, I guess, uh, do a stale alarm based on that same thing. Uh, we haven't done that yet. We've talked about it. Um, I, I'm not going to even promise you a timeline for development, but uh, the pad date is there, yes. The album art, hopefully someday. How's that? There you go. <laughs> um, so Tim Koza also asks a third question. Um, he was wondering if baseband 192 or analog composite um, can be used when time correction is being done in the FMXI 4G. Um, if you're doing the time correction in the analog chain, no, um, because only AES is in and out of this box, uh, AES left and right. Uh, but the reason we did support doing the delay in the digital domain is if you then you can run your analog straight, your, your digital MPX straight from your processor to your FM transmitter, FM exciter, and not run it through the FMXI. So that would be the only way uh, is to do it indirectly, not directly through the box. Mm -hmm. And I, ha I have some drawings of that. If, if you have some more questions on the, that configuration, Tim, I'd be happy to follow up with the drawing after the fact or, or anybody else that needs one, they can send me a, an email. And there you go. Um, and speaking of email um and i suspect yeah there's the there's the screen um just gonna let people know that uh, this is how people will get in touch with you if you have if they have any questions is that uh the k-h-a-i-d-e-r at gatesair.com um so yeah at, at this point i think we're i think we're pretty good with questions um, if, uh, and, and as such, if you have any others and need some more specific help, uh, certainly feel free to reach out to Kevin. Um, that's me speaking f for him <laughs> online here. Um, absolutely. And, and, and thank you everybody today for joining us. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, yeah, thanks again for, yeah, it's a fantastic presentation. I think a lot of people's, um, you know, wheels are turning in their heads right now. Um, trying to see what what they can do to update um, and just the awesome opportunities and, and capabilities that this would, would offer. So uh, once again, this webinar is going to um, be recorded and that recording will be available here on gatesair.com and at our YouTube channel using the same links that you use uh, to view the live presentation. Um, so definitely feel free to come back and review. Um, it's also also going to be at gatesairuniversity.com. If you haven't checked that out, please, please, uh, take a look at that site and let us know what you think. Um, stay tuned for info about our next webinar, which will introduce our new Gates Air SRL broadcasting solutions, uh, which are brought about by our recent acquisition of OneTastic um, out of Brescia, Italy. Uh, now we're calling it Gates Air SRL. And we're gonna talk about TV and DAB plus transmitters from low to high power and everything in between, uh, tower mounted external transmission, uh, multi-channel solutions and uh, switchers and, and a whole lot more. So that one's going to be huge. Um, I'll have some info heading out soon. Um, in fact, if any of you out there have any ideas for future webinar topics that, that we uh, can help bring up to the masses, uh, including course material for Gates Air University, please let us know at marketing at gatesair.com or you can email me directly. I'm Keith uh, at kadams at gatesair.com. So thanks again, everybody, for attending this Gates Air Connect webinar. Uh, for Kevin Hyder, this and all of us here at Gates Air, uh, this is Keith Adams saying, see you next time. And hey, let's stay connected. Have a good day.